you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Can you hear me well? We had some issues with microphones. All working? Good. Let's assume it does. So, I'm really happy to see you here. It's the third time I'm here, actually. Third time on PyCon Slovakia. And every time I come, every time I come, I see this logo. I'm wondering when will they print that on money, right? Because it, it looks totally perfect for the Euro bill. There is some connection with the president, as far as I know. Maybe I push this a bit for the next one. I would be happy to get some coins like that. So today we're talking most about the distributed systems. And for the beginning, I would just like you to ask you to imagine on a very abstract level, how would a perfect system look like? You know, when you think, when you think about the manufacturing a real product, thanks to the long evolution of humanity, we have some concept that gets, gets pretty close to the perfect. It's a factory. Right? There is a perfect separation of concerns because each node is doing own thing, just passes on the product forward, and um, it works perfectly on a big scale. People, they tend to copy successful patterns everywhere. So we also see that pretty often in the software, in the software architectures. However, um, there is a little catch though. Like right now, especially with all of our cloud technologies, container-based ar architectures and so on, like every advocate on YouTube would say that microservices, we are finally there. It's a factory. It's a perfect factory, but in the software. However, they also say that with microservices, we can have micro teams that would build uh, micro products and that each micro team can use own language, it can use their own stack. That's not so true because if we continue like this, uh, this uh, metaphor over here, it would mean that each dude over here would be uh, speaking different language. Let's say here would be a Slovak guy, here Ukrainian and here Peruvian. That's no problem with that, but I bet they would have some trouble communicating in the long run. So I prepared a better metaphor for you, uh, the, the one that shows the real, the real thing. It's a zoo. It's a zoo of microservices because we can have billing in Python, permission system in Ruby, admin panel inherited in PHP, and then fronted on Angular. And this whole thing, it barks, it meows. The components, they don't really understand each other. They have some common interface, but, but they don't really understand each other. Oh, sorry, I forgot the fish, but fish doesn't speak. It just writes logs to the hard drive. So, <laughs> Yeah, that gets really confusing quickly. And the goal of this talk today is to, is to turn maybe the zoo into more organized structure, like a circus, for instance. So let's start small. Let's start with the stack. The stack and the problem is not just in the language. The, the more variety of stacks we have, the harder it is to maintain, obviously. And let's say in Python, we would use uh, pip or pip env install when we push the code. Then we run the tests, we run the linter, uh, we finally prepare some sort of package. That's how it works in Python. In Java, it would be totally different. Java has to be compiled. That has to be uh, compiled into the WAR file or JAR file. And then if you think of a front end, oh God, there is so many compilers, then the minimizer, the shims, the prefixes, you got the idea, totally different stack. So talking about that, if that was your old monolith written in one language, it's not very stable, yeah. So you thought, well, that doesn't really look solid. I split it up into microservices, and what you get? You get many little Jenga towers that are not reliable, they're just little. But each of the towers has own stack, it would be, again, the JavaScript stack, the Java stack, and so on. So that doesn't really scale that well. What choices do you have here? If something goes wrong in one of these towers, and your React team is sick, let's say, you either have to quickly learn React, which you can forget about, because there are so many JavaScript frameworks at the moment. Uh, I have a good slide for that, actually, from JS Congress in Munich. Uh, there are some milk products that uh, last longer than JavaScript frameworks. I think it reflects perfectly <laughs> the state of today's situation in front-end. So forget it. Even if you are super smart, they always come up with something new and there will be always a person who would be willing to use that. So just forget about it. And then you might think, oh, but we have DevOps in our team. DevOps would, would just fix the stack if something goes wrong. But that's also not quite true because I saw your DevOps guy. Yeah, that guy, he, he was running somewhere from your office when you just introduced this whole concept. So. That's, that's, that's hard, at least in the first stage. Let's get, again, serious and try to reuse some, 
successful patterns from big companies. How did they introduce it? How did Netflix do it? Netflix is kind of a pioneer in the world of microservices. They started from scratch, from I mean, from the huge monolith, and now they are one of the like best cases with a lot of software released into open source into managing their microservices. So uh, they share their experience on a lot of conferences, and on one of the conferences, uh, they said something. So they have more than 500 microservices, I think, uh, back then at least they had. And they said that how do they manage this variety of stacks? How did they manage it in the beginning at least? It was pretty easy. Well, they had their standard toolkit in Java, something that did uh, repetitive tasks like the logging, uh, distributed tracing, uh, discovery, and so on. And they, they had that software in Java. And when the new guy came into the team, they asked like, hey, there is this super new JavaScript framework. I want to write a microservice in that. The team lead said, yeah, we welcome all of the languages in Netflix. Please pick whatever you like. But if for some reason, just by accident, what you pick would be Java, you would get our package with the monitoring, with logging, and with everything. But if not, you are totally free to use uh, JavaScript, and you just have to implement it yourself and support 24-7 every day. Well, then many, many people thought, well, Java is not such a bad language, actually. I can just probably just use that. So this is our first learning on a really small scale. Well, we just cannot afford to have a big variety of technologies. We can stick with one. It's not so bad. If you pick a reliable technology, a widely used technology, uh, and you use it, such as Java, everything would be perfect. I'm kidding, of course. I, I never saw angry Slovakians. I wanted to see uh, what would it be if I promote Java at this conference. No. Obviously, obviously we'll take Python. So again, we start small. And now let's just quickly, quickly go over tools that we have in Python that would be cool to use as a microservice. And then we go to the higher concepts. So uh, Django, believe, me, believe it or not, there are people writing microservices in Django. I mean, there is nothing wrong with that. If you want, you can also use a truck to go grocery shopping. That's fine if you're like, if you're an expert, why not if that works for you? It works for so many people. However, the whole concept of Django is that it comes with the batteries. And here, the chances are that each battery that you love so much should be a separate microservice. So Django is, is a monolithic design, in my opinion. You can use it if you're really good in it, but there are other things in the Python ecosystem, like Flask. Flask is little, tiny. Its whole concept of this Flask minimalism fits really, really well in the concept of microservices. However, it's not very fast. That's the problem. It's not very fast and it's synchronous. So considering a synchronous framework for microservice, yeah, I mean, it would work if you like it, if, it's, if you don't have high, high availability and reliability uh, concerns. But there is also a Quart framework. It's not popular at all, but it's just basically a clone of Flask, which is running on AsyncIO and the UV loop. And not only it's fast, it's also synchronous. So meaning that if you have many, Quartz talking to each other would consume zero resources unless there is high, high CPU intense task running over there. So I can recommend taking a look at that. And again, I, I totally understand that Flask has a cooler logo. Yes, we all love Flask. It's minimalistic and it's just cool. It's, you know, a, a framework for grown up professionals, like, for, like Fiat 500. For those, for those who don't have to compensate anything by the size of the framework, right? So I love Flask, I use it myself, but if it goes about the performance, take a look at Quart. Then, there are other options over there. IEHTP, we don't have to discuss, I'm sure it's well covered on this conference. It has native support of Python coroutines, so it's just a no-brainer question. Then there is Tornado. Tornado is more than 10 years old as far as I know. It's so well tested. It's so production ready. You can probably just kick it to production while watching series on the second monitor. Nothing will happen. It's, it's already pretty reliable. Then there's Falcon. Falcon is fast. It's not that popular, but many benchmarks say it's the fastest web framework, uh, web server, in this case, in Python. So I never used it, I have to say, uh, in, the bare, uh, in the bare minimum of it, at least. Uh, but I heard many good feedback about it. And then finally, there is Hug. Hug is new, Hug is fancy, Hug is cute, obviously. And it uses Falcon behind the scenes. So uh, a server running behind Hug is Falcon. So it's also fast. So I can also recommend that. And Hug generates you the CLI interface out of the box. So you build the API, you get something like uh, AWS tools or Azure tools, CLI commands generated for you. That's cool. And if you think that I picked Hug just because of the name, you're wrong. 
I picked it because of the logo. <laughs> then the project grows. The project grows and we understand that it's naive to lock us in the Python ecosystem. Let's take again the experience from a bigger companies. How did they do it? And coming back to Netflix and their Java packages, they had in principle the right idea. They thought, all right, we developed this cool stack that works in Java. We want to use it in other languages too. So we need to package it separately and make it available on the, on the higher level, on the operating system level somehow via sockets, uh, or whatever to the other uh, software components that it would make it uh, language agnostic. So that was a good idea. However, running uh, several processes in a single container is sort of a bad style, right? We all know that. So now we come to the fun part, container patterns. The first pattern that is uh, mostly used, I think, everywhere right now is the sidecar pattern. Sidecars, they uh, extend and enhance the main container. For example, if the main container would be, a, I'll just show you the picture. If the main container would be a, a web server, think of a sidecar with a logging uh, mechanism. If you have a normal web server and you want to do logging to a remote service, you would integrate some tool or maybe even something like Sentry that would connect to a remote server and send logs or traces or whatever over there. That doesn't really scale well because uh, probably this external service is also somewhere in your infrastructure. You'd have to manage uh, the network and you would have to write the adapter for each software component that would make it capable of speaking with the remote logging server. So uh, what is the idea of the sidecar is that your main container will just log into file system. Syslog, that's it, easy. It writes as usual on syslog and every software can do that. And then the sidecar is sharing the volume, the, the hard drive with, with the main container. And it just reads logs from the volume, processes it and sends whatever it thinks it should be sent. This way your main container is totally, totally independent of the sidecar. It just writes to the syslog, that's it, problem solved. And it actually is uploaded to some remote logging cluster, but you never have to implement it yourself, which is pretty cool. And last but not least, we all know that sidecars are mostly cool because you can put the, the dog in glasses in that, not the log server. The next pattern, ambassador. It's a similar concept. Ambassador is, you know, a big important fella that hides some bigger, even bigger entity behind. Let's say that would be, a, a, what would it be, a Redis cluster. So you have an ambassador of a Redis cluster, again, within the same pod, as your main container, they share the host. They are both on the local host, just two containers next to each other. And whenever you need to speak to the big, huge Redis cluster, you speak to ambassador. Ambassador is always on local host. That makes the network discovery gone. You just always speak to the same port on the local host and you know the Redis is over there. Behind the scenes, ambassador would manage all the failover stuff, discovery stuff. It would see which replica is now active, if the connection was dropped, how should I reconnect? Uh, doing the whole, uh, yeah, as I said, failover mechanisms, that all uh, lays on the responsibility of the ambassador. And your main container can just focus on doing the right thing, the business logic. Finally, we get to the last pattern that I'll be covering today. It's the adapter pattern. Adapter is sort of an ambassador, but in the opposite direction. So if, if ambassador, uh, is showing, you a is showing your main container with a simplified view of the outside world, the adapter turns this picture around and it's showing a simplified view of your container to the outside world. Practical example, monitoring. Imagine you have some monitoring system that you cannot change. You just have to use it as it is. And so this monitoring system should go on some health check endpoint. And in some containers, that would be a URL. In some containers, that would be a file. In some containers, you would just have to do PS and grab it for the right process, check if it's running. So different ways to check if a service is alive. And one system that has to check all of the containers if they are alive. So you write an adapter that is just, uh, is basically forwarding requests from the outside into your container. And it does this check. It says, all right, in this container, we need to check the URL. We check the URL, it's alive. In this, we need to check a file. It checks a file and sends back the response. It's alive. So it's like a proxy in the opposite direction as ambassador. 
So these are like three mostly used, uh, uh, mostly used patterns that I've seen personally. They are not so fresh anymore, and there are many, many articles with the more sophisticated cases. But we just want to have you know, a little preview right now, so I'll move forward. Yeah, this is ambassador, uh, this is adapter, sorry for skipping this slide, but I explained it to you already. So next, now we need to connect all of this concept in practice. So what would be a straightforward idea? Straightforward thing would be to collect uh, all of the remote services like databases, caching and so on as ambassadors and put that in sidecar container next to your main container. Yeah, they, they can be used together, it's not a problem. So this way we will have our business logic that would do just the thing that it actually should do and the communication functions that would take care of the well, monitoring, logging, uh, observing the network, uh, circuit breaking, uh, failover, and so on. We put these communication functions and we, uh, we, we put it in the sidecar containers that would be running in the same pod if we're speaking about Kubernetes as our main container. And we just don't have to implement these uh, repetitive features in our main container, would it be Python, Java, or whatever else. However, there is still one issue left here that we need to address. The problem is that even if we offload this in the sidecar container, the containers still need to communicate somehow. And we're not only speaking with the Redis or with the database, the, the containers, they speak with each other as well. That would mean that we would either, for container A to connect to container B, we would have to either hard code the network address of the container B in container A so that it knows where to look for it on the network. Over the DNS maybe, that's the most popular case. DNS, it works at the beginning, but when you need to uh, do a failover really quick, DNS stops working because of the caching. So it's uh, not something good in the long run. Uh, or you can, of course, create an ambassador for every service you have, which would be also weird and stupid. That would be just extra work that you'd have to do. So we need another concept here to deal with the network discovery and failover. And that's a service mesh. So the service mesh is sort of a centralized component in this system uh, that uh, supports network functions such as resiliency, service discovery, and so on. So that your developers or you can just focus on doing the business logic and the sidecar container will pick up all of the configuration of the network and of itself from the service mesh. Here you can say that the problem with this is that we're introducing again a single point of failure. Now that's not quite true because the, the service mesh is just storing the configuration and updating uh, the sidecars with this configuration. But the containers, they communicate directly. As soon as each of the sidecars gets the configuration update from the service mesh, it's independent. So even if this goes down, they still continue to communicate. They would not get updates, but they, the work goes on. And highly unlikely will your whole architecture, you know, be crashed within a minute. You will probably have some time to uh, bring up the, uh, the backup of a service mesh uh, main controller. Or in the worst case, you can just send the configs via, via SSH, the SCP. It's just a config, it's just a file. It's not such a big deal, not so difficult. So this way, uh, we are totally uh, uploading the responsibility of uh, all of the network's functions to the service mesh and sidecar containers. And at this point, we really do not care in which language is business logic written, because one business logic is not touching another anyhow. Here I just summarized again everything that the service mesh will do for you. Uh, routing, I think, is clear as to which, uh, to, to which endpoint to send the data. Access control, again, a big system in microservices. You would have either have to manage it independently in each container or you have to centralize it. Then discovery also clear, resiliency clear, and observability. I think we just went through it all uh, already. Good. So, if you integrate it all, it doesn't mean, of course, that your system will wor work as a charm right away. It's again, it's the question on which stage are you at the moment. At the beginning, you're good with just normal containers uh, speaking with each other over uh, HTTP using DNS for discovery. That works perfectly well. Then when you get difficulties, you would probably think of ambassadors to at least abstract away like clusters uh, like the memcache, for instance, or the database. When you get even further, you would think of a sidecar, and then when it gets totally complicated, you introduce a service mesh. That's how it works. 
So this way we will have finally a happy zoo with happy services there and me even more happy because I have such a great audience. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the talk and uh, we have some questions. Uh, maybe number one, which is most voted for with four votes is, uh, when should we switch from monolith application to microservices? Are there any tools to facilitate this migration? Like where, where is the choice? Where do I make the choice? Uh, you don't have to switch. That's the easy question. Is the, the easy question and the easy answer. You don't have to. Just for the sake of it, well, I know I am, uh, I, uh, if you're a freelancer, <laughs> You will have better contract because the, the migration will run forever. <laughs> that, that's one of the reasons. I run a software agency, that's why maybe I, I know this topic so well. Uh, but no kidding, you don't have to switch until you see it's time to switch. When you hit the wall, you see that there is no more reason in scaling Django instances horizontally. It works on the limit. Your Postgres databases are also on the limit because you just have maximum connections used on the machine. You're running on the biggest uh, machine in the Amazon that you have then it's a, it's obvious situation. You need to switch to a different concept, and that's a different concept. But you don't have to. Again, going microservices right from the beginning is an overkill. If you are a one-man one team, or even a two- or five-man team, I would not recommend it. It only brings you some value when you have such big teams that every person in the team, let's say of 50, have to go through the same code base and learn the same code base again and again. That's of course, is not scaling well. So what you do is you split that huge code base in a little project, and then each micro team can work with own little project. And it's much easier, as you know, to maintain a little project as comparing to the huge project. It doesn't scale linearly with the complexity, right? So that's one reason. Some people would say it's future-proof. There are even cooler buzzwords, cloud native. It is cloud native indeed, but the, 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 the effort of migration is big. I have to admit, it's, it's pretty big and the concept is new. And even though I even put here uh, one more slide with, uh, with existing platforms that would uh, um, just like, you know, plug and play service mesh for you. Even though these exist, I think that Istio is still in beta and Linkert, yeah, maybe exists for one or two years. It is production ready, but there are not enough information, not, there is not enough information on Stack Overflow available and so on. Now it's, it's hard, unless you have to, don't switch. But there will be a point when you will have to, because we all know every framework, even cool one, will hit the wall at some point, and then that's the way to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, what do you think, uh, what do you do when the service mesh is unavailable? It's a service as well, isn't it? It's a single point of failure. Yeah, I think I covered it briefly already. So yes, it's a single point of failure. Uh, but it's a single point of failure that's managing configuration. When it's crashing, your local containers still have the configuration there. It's not proxying the requests. It just tells sidecar containers where is bot. It's sort of a DNS on steroids. One of its tasks is DNS on steroids. So if the thing will be down, you would probably have no monitoring and no logging for some time. Yes. Uh, logging would be replicated, obviously. It's a whole different topic of distributed logging and distributed tracing that deserves a separate talk. But yeah, some services will be unavailable, but the system will be fully, fully functional because your uh, containers will have the latest configuration locally so that they can discover other containers without contacting the service mesh. Service mesh is just distributing the updates. It's not storing a configuration uh, that you don't, you don't have to request the configuration every time, and it's not proxying anything. And if it even fails, you can still use just whatever copy-paste tool of configuration you want, if, if you just cannot bring it up, and you have to distribute the update to all of your cluster, you just send it via SCP and it's done. Fabric okay. or whatever. Thank you, And The last question, is it efficient to start developing with microservices? Because updating many interfaces on many services is very slow and frequent in the beginnings. Yeah. As I said, it's, it's efficient on big teams. If you have a big team, imagine a new colleague joining you and you have to show your huge monolith without understanding all of it, your colleague would not even get started. Comparing to that, if the service is relatively small or it's even new, it would be much easier to, uh, uh, to get new people you know, on the right pace in your project. That's one thing. 
as I said. And another thing is uh, horizontal scalability. Also already mentioned that it's much easier to do it with you if you have more little services as compared to one huge service because you just physically hit the limit of the operating system and of physical machines. Okay, and uh, last question, which I really love and I have to say to you. All the concepts you've presented, service mesh, ambassadors, adapters, have already been applied in Java. How do they translate to Python? Yeah, uh, in principle, when we speak about microservices, we actually were using all of our object-oriented patterns. We just apply it on a different level, on a different concept. So that's absolutely true, even though the patterns are not the same. If you think even there is even factory pattern, it has nothing to do with the, with the factory as a process, as we discussed over here. So actually, this isolation and encapsulation uh, not polymorphism, but still, the, the concepts of object-oriented programming is applicable also on the architecture level, especially on microservices. So yes, it's similar, similar concept, but the way it's implemented is totally different. Like if in Java, it's pure software level thing. One class is calling another class. Here we speak about uh, a lot more things. We have the network layer in between. That's the main problem that we've been solving today, the network. If you just if you use uh, Java or Python, you just assume that one function can call another function, no problem. It will work forever. You cannot assume this in the world of microservices, that one can just call another over a network. It sometimes doesn't work. If you have a lot of microservices, your network will get overloaded. It probably didn't happen if you have monolithic architecture, because it's pretty straightforward to scale that with a load balancer. But when you have really, really like thousands of services running in one network, it can go down. And then a simple call of one function from another place, from another service, won't work. So these patterns are similar concepts, but they work totally different. And in my credits here, I posted one link, I think, uh, this first one, design patterns for container-based distributed system. It's much bigger than what I presented today. I just presented a very basic, simple subset. It has much more. I totally recommend you to read this. I think it's written by Google people. Actually, all of the references are pretty useful here. Go through it. It will, it will show you some code probably as well, because I didn't want to include code. It would be just too much for this presentation. But uh, to sum it up, the concept is similar. The implementation is way different. It's totally different from Java, from Python, or from whatever you've seen. Oh, thank you very much, Anton. This was Anton Caceres. Thank you. Thank you.